All right. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to dive right into this because I have way too many slides uh, for this talk. If anyone's heard me do a program before, especially our like the Birding Basics series I do with Maine Audubon, um, I'm not great at sticking to my allotted time. Uh, I just remember uh, being in um, freshman up at UMaine Orono taking this public speaking course, and they told us that uh, a good way to time yourself is like one minute per slide. Uh, that'll like set the pace. I have 139 slides. <laughs> so let's, uh, we'll keep the pace going here. Um, uh, as Bill mentioned, so this was a, a trip that we did with field guides. Maine Audubon has been doing a number of these uh, tours with them, partnering um, uh, to give us opportunities to, to do more work kind of outside of the state. Field guides does amazing uh, uh, tours all over the world, um, I would highly recommend it. Recommend um, working with them. I think they're absolutely exceptional at what they do. So a quick plug, uh, um, we've, we've done a number of these. Um, I think I've done some of these talks here in the past. Um, we're hoping to get some lined up for both this winter and, and into next year. Um, but stay tuned on that. Field Guides um, is having a, 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 a some issues uh, uh, scheduling. One of their um, one of the best guides you could you could ever ask for. Tom Johnson unfortunately passed away unexpectedly, um, and now there's um, it's taking a, a, a lot of people um, a lot of work to help kind of cover an otherwise an otherwise uh, full time guide schedule. So we'll sneak in some um, as we can. But I did just want to show. Look at all the happy faces when we're in Costa Rica after seeing our resplendent Quetzal. Look at the amazed faces as the yellow rail flew by. That's uh, that little blur off the right hand side. Uh, <laughs> the most elusive rail uh, really in North America flying right in front of our faces. Um, one of my favorite birds uh, because of its beauty, the gray silky flycatcher was a, a great highlight on our Oaxaca tour. Um, and we've even done some in the States. This was our um, South Texas tour. So Whatever I can do to uh, motivate you, um, we get to go really cool places seeing amazing birds. And uh, so tonight I just want to focus on this this trip we did um, to Guatemala. Um, uh, as Bill said, it was back in, in March of this year. Uh, to help orient ourselves, um, I think uh, Gu Guatemala is one of those countries that I think a lot of people like generally know, but if you were asked to like put a dot on a map, you'd all miss it. <laughs> um, it helps to know it's kind of nicely situated, um, essentially between um, like just south of Mexico. You pass the the Isthmus, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, I'll refer to a lot because there's a lot of birds that are these Yucatan endemics and they just get into the northern part of, of Guatemala. Um, Belize kind of sits off to the, the right side along the coast. Um, but this, uh, I'd, I'd call it a straight line. It's fun at this scale. The, the line actually has to curve, um, but it's just over 2,300 uh, miles if you're going to go you know, straight line from Portland to, to Guatemala City. So really not, not terribly far. Um, the fun thing to see you know, quickly on this map is that we're, we're definitely into, we call this NCA, uh, Northern Central America. So you get a lot of those Central American birds. There's a lot of Mexican birds. And then as um, I won't talk about a ton because there's just too much to talk about tonight. Um, a lot of our birds, our birds, the birds that we think about spending the summers here breeding, lots of our warblers, tanagers, vireos, you name it, are wintering here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll make a little plug for Magnolia Warbler towards the end. They were uh, pretty much one of the most abundant songbirds I think we saw there was, was Magnolia Warbler. Also fun to just think about the scale uh, that is Guatemala. Um, might be a little hard to see on that, but the, the background map there is actually Maine. You can you, Maybe you can see New Hampshire poking out a little bit better uh, below it. But Guatemala is, is roughly the same size as Maine, which is kind of a, a fun way to think about it. Uh, maybe the key difference is the amount of people that we're packing into these areas. So Maine's population around 1.3 million. Guatemala is 17 million. Um, 
I'll show a little topography in a second, but the other fun thing to think about is in Maine, our, our highest elevation, Katahdin, uh, just over 5,200 feet. Um, the tallest mountain in Guatemala is just shy of 14,000. So they've got quite the elevation uh, uh, going on there. And, and we'll see how that impacts some of the, the birds that you get to see. Um, so we're zooming in on, on Guatemala here. Sorry, on, on this scale, we, we do lose some, some boundaries. But what all these little dots are showing, um, this is from eBird. If you haven't seen the cool feature that eBird has, you can generate trip reports. Um, eBird was the citizen science project we were using to submit all of the checklists of all the locations we went. It does a wonderful job kind of generating these, these reports. So you can nicely see where you went, the birds you saw, um, include all your photos and everything. So that's what I just pulled. So each one of these little pins um, shows one of the locations that we went to. Um, and there's this nice divide here where we're kind of north in this region called the Petten. And then as we went uh, down south, kind of south of Guatemala City and then working west, that got us onto the Pacific Slope. Uh, what I was hoping would show up a little bit better here, you can kind of see the topography, but that's quite the mountain range. It's actually like the continental divide that we're on in those southern um, those southern pins. So there's a lot of birds as, as you get down here, there's, there's quite a divide between what's on the more kind of um, tropical Caribbean slope and what you find on the Pacific slope. So that was kind of um, how we were, you know, approaching this trip, trying to divide it up. We won't go into this too much. This is just, um, I thought, kind of an interesting way to kind of look at the different bioregions of Guatemala. Um, especially, I think this does a good job showing that that northern uh, Paten region is really this, this, as it identifies here, tropical humid forest. So it is going to be more lowland forest. It's going to be <laughs> tropical humid. Uh, um, uh, quite the contrast to some of the higher elevation where we would get into things like coniferous forest, um, conifer and broadleaf. Uh, the sad thing to maybe point out here, along the southern coast there, what, what it's basically identifying as this, the humid savanna, um, there's something like 1% or less of that habitat remaining. Uh, that's where it's really good for growing things like sugarcane, cotton, um, and it has all been um, maybe deforested isn't the right word, de-savannahed. <laughs> um, uh, so that was kind of a, a, a sad thing to see that there is truly um, uh, a lot of habitat destruction has has gone on here. We, we drove through it kind of briefly. I'll, I'll show some photos, but um, basically this, this is kind of um, a fun thing to think about in terms of the, uh, the habitats that we were able to get into. Also fun to think about this habitat. <laughs> Here we are, uh, beginning of March. Um, this is flying out of Portland. Um, we would not see any snow like this, uh, at least for the 10 days we were there. Um, always the fun perspective leaving Maine. This is one of the few times I've flown out in the afternoon. I, I cut the photos, but actually I've got great shots all along the coast of um, the fun landmarks pointing out. but. What I wanted to point out here, why we've got the timestamps, this flight was 2.30 in the afternoon, leaving Portland. Um, had one layover in D.C. for about an hour, and then it was uh, just before 10 o'clock Central Time. So we are an hour off um, that we finally got into Guatemala City. Um, it's a very easy flight. It's pretty quick. Uh, that one stopover in D.C., uh, I... I I like going places that are easy to get to. And so always interesting to look at some, some locations that you have like three or four stops in or out. Um, I'll apologize for some reason, a bunch of these videos like got flipped. So this should play correctly, let's see. Yeah, what I wanted to quickly show is there, Guatemala City, there are a ton of like really nice high-end hotels. This is a fun thing. I just want to make the plug, if you're ever thinking of going there, a lot of these hotels are there to host um, people traveling for business. Um, there's a lot of like conventions and things that go on in Guatemala City. So these hotels are pretty packed full throughout the week. Um, 
and uh, I would say are not the least expensive option until the weekend when there's no people traveling for business. They're dead empty and they're super cheap. So if you want to go birding in Guatemala, maybe uh, stay in the city in the weekend. I could talk for an entire hour just about the food in, in Guatemala. Um, I'll make a few more plugs, but um, oh my God, it was so good. Especially, um, we'll make some more references. The coffee down there is uh, really the best. It, it cannot be beat. Um, so here we all are. Here we all are gathering. You might recognize some people in this uh, in this video. Um, going over the map here, this is uh, Jesse Fagan, our guide from Field Guide. So the way the kind of uh, partnership works is in Audubon, we bring the people. Field Guides will give us a guide who has been there and knows the area. Jesse lived in Guatemala for a number of years. And then we'll, we also work with local guides in all the areas we went. So first night, um, we made sure everyone uh, got in, got there on time. And then we kind of were just going over the map here, going over our plan. It was early to bed uh, that first night because it was early to rise. We, we try not to get up too early if you use the timestamp on here. This was 3.50, we're loading up um, the bus. Uh, these were the vehicles that we would be getting around um, uh, throughout the country. Always hiring a local driver. Uh, you do not want me driving around in, in Guatemala. Um, but pretty comfortable, very spacious. The reason that we needed to leave so early was to find this awesome plane. Um, so we, we flew in Guatemala City, and as you may remember from that earlier map of all the pins of where we were birding, we needed to get up to the Paten, um, up into the northern part of the country. It's a very long drive. It's a very short flight. Um, again, think of it as we're going, you know, if you were to fly from, you know, I should have looked it up a little better. Not quite Bangor, but like a little, little further from, um, from there. Uh, absolutely stunning, um, especially watching the geography change. Uh, you know, we had this beautiful sunrise um, flying over these mountains. Um, and this is kind of getting us out of that, uh, you know, montane habitat. We're going to get down into this more kind of Caribbean lowlands. Um, so kind of fun to see. Fast forward towards the end of the flight. This is looking out my window and how um, the habitat just starts to get like really flat, Maybe, you know, little hills and things, but um, it was pretty amazing to get up there and, and just, you know, flying over the habitat and watching it change as we went was really cool. So by seven o'clock, we're getting into the airport. Uh, always fun traveling with birders because we have, we're just trying to get through security or whatever, and, and everyone's whipping out binoculars. We've, um, there are things like metal larks, um, um, at least killdeer. Uh, uh, there were birds to be seen. We had um, martins flying overhead. So we had a vehicle there waiting for us, one of our local guides um, that picked us up. We had a bit of a drive to go to get up to um, uh, our first stop, the first place we would be staying. So a lot of we would find good habitat. You know, Jesse knew some of these spots along the way. Um, I didn't take out my camera yet, so we'll bear with me for some of these poorly digiscoped. Like, trust me, that's a pinnated bittern, um, a really good bird down there. Um, but just doing some like roadside birding. Now, there are some funny hazards of roadside birding down here when all of a sudden you have to say, everyone on the bus, on the bus, hurry, we are getting on the bus. And we had pretty good timing. <laughs> Because these cattle apparently got out of uh, where they were supposed to be. Um, we'll see our local rancher, I think, comes by in a second. If not, I'll jump to this clip. I think you can see them. Um, they decided to hang out. Notice where they're going off into the left. So, this marsh that we were just birding and counting, you know, all the dozens of whistling ducks. Um, here he is. Um, this guy was yelling. Uh, I don't know what he was saying, but he was unhappy. And all these cows are just going like out into the marsh now, you know, wonderful area for them to, <laughs> to be grazing in their minds. So uh, that was fun. Not a thing we usually deal with birding in Maine. 
As we were driving north, trying to get up to this biological station we'd be staying at, we did pass through some areas. Um, I think it's important to highlight this, um, uh, where they were doing some, uh, uh, essentially, some slash and burn agriculture. The, the um, soil there is really low quality. It's really hard to grow anything in this area. So there's a lot of the slash and burn where they're going to, you know, cut everything down, burn it. You get a, it takes a couple of years, but that puts all this nutrients in the soil. Then they can grow things on it for a couple of years and then they've completely depleted it. And unfortunately, you know, then you're kind of left with, uh, uh, you're left with nothing. Um, and it'll take many years for that to, to grow back. At least we're kind of in the tropics, stuff does tend to grow a little fast, um, but it's one of those, I think, sad realities where, you know, the, the people who are living down there need to find ways to um, survive off that land. Um, and unfortunately, this is the way um, they have to do it. Lots of roadside birding. I always enjoy, you know, birders birding is hilarious to me. Um, this, is, this was just like a little puddle on the side of the road. And like the really fun thing about this, the density of birds, like you could just pull over anywhere and get 20, 30, 40 species of birds. Um, we had some real targets, some things we'd be looking for. Remember, we're going north. We're getting up into this Bataan region. We're finally getting into where some of the Yucatan endemics. So species that you can only find around the Yucatan, um, whether it's in Mexico, whether it's coming into Guatemala here. Um, one of them here, the Yucatan woodpecker, appropriately named, um, folks might recognize this looks like a bird similar to our backyards. Um, it even has a red belly, probably more than our red-bellied woodpecker does. Um, and this is a fun one to see. Uh, so that genus Melanerpsis are all these woodpeckers that kind of look and sound like this. And, and it's kind of fun to see like, oh, the one that evolved in the Yucatan looks like this. Fun to be looking around and have things like Swainson's hawks flying over. They'd be, you know, they'll be migrating through there in, in absolutely huge numbers. Um, eventually getting us to uh, the Rio de San Pedro, um, this large river. Um, I took all the audio out of this because I knew it would be terrible. That's Jesse waving goodbye to our luggage on the shore. Uh, that would be brought over in the boat a little bit later. But we had, uh, it was just under an hour. I think it took about 40 minutes traveling um, by boat till we could see this little, I didn't mute them all. Um, see that little building poking out right there? And here's some more that starts to become evident. This was a biological station that was started just for researchers to be um, studying, um, as we'll see, this is called Las Guacamayas Bi Biological Station. There's actually been a, a, a lot of studies that have been done there. What they realized was that uh, when research wasn't being done, they could help kind of keep this place afloat, um, uh, uh, have a staff there by hosting tourists and visitors, um, people that would want to go birding in there um, or whatever uh, you might be interested in. I was, uh, one afternoon, I got so into some of the dragonflies along the river. I haven't been able to identify like any of them yet, but I have hundreds of photos. Um, I just wanted to make the, the you know the quick mention like again the, the the food in these places was absolutely incredible. Um, soup was such a like staple like um, appetizer for almost every meal. And then any way that you could turn a fruit into a drink, um, they figured out how to do it. Um, even fruit that you've uh, or I have never even heard of. Um, just birding the grounds um you know this this was a long day for us you know we, we'd been up super early flew up there this long drive um another boat to get there um so a few of us just birding the grounds and, and this is kind of the wonderful thing that even when um even if you have downtime you can be looking up at things like black cowled orioles um squirrel cuckoos working the, the you know shrubs think of like you know same way you might find a cuckoo or a really skulky bird around here Looking straight up, we have a uh, white hawk circling for a minute. Uh, King Vulture was on the, the property here. Um, uh, tough when these birds like fly by and, you know, the typical flyby of bird, you've got 10 seconds to shout out about it, but 
Um, that was just during our downtime. Uh, for our afternoon activity, um, the last birding, we decided to get back on the river. Um, this is just a better perspective of the boat. Um, this is pretty common, especially in, in Central America, a lot of birding by boat. Um, I hate birding by boat in, in Maine. Maybe I'm biased after working at the Scarborough Marsh for six summers, pointing out birds in boats. But this is incredible because here, you know, you have things like we need woodpeckers. So this is, you know, same size as like a, a pileated woodpecker um, that's just got a lot more color and pattern to it. Fun to see some of these, these you know, same niches, you know, the pileated versus the lineated. This might remind you a lot of our tree swallows. Mangrove swallow has that little white eyebrow and then some white on the rump. Uh, and then our big target, I, I, if I could, uh, if, if I could go back and record all the oohs and ahs, this is, this is American pygmy kingfisher, which putting it up on a projector like this um, really doesn't do it much service because it's it's this big. <laughs> um, uh, it lives up to the name pygmy uh, kingfisher. It, it is absolutely tiny, um, remarkable um, uh, that we could even, you know, spot a bird like this. The nice thing is that they tend to be super tame. You know, we're getting into these these areas that are like so seldomly, uh, seldom seldomly visited, and you know, we literally just backed the boat like right up to this bird. Um, didn't mind us at all. One of our big targets, which as we're you know we're cruising the river at pretty high speed, um, just scanning, always trying to, to spot something. Um, I believe credit fully goes to uh, Jesse for this. Um, Agami heron, uh, which imagine traveling at high speed and can you see right just above center, looking for that red eyeball. I know you can see the blue reflection in the water, but like this is looking back, this is overexposed because it's in this dark shadowy area, this, this um, the gummy heron just has this incredibly long bill, this, this rusty color and blue on the wings. Um, really tough uh, scenario for, for photographing it, but it did catch a fish. Trust me, a lot easier to see through binoculars. Um, I, I did feel like I have to do this credit and show, you know, that's what, uh, you know, if it were to come out, um, uh, that's an absolutely incredible bird. Um, uh, so nice to, to check off that. That was definitely one of our biggest targets. That bill is insane. Um, I'd love to, you know, that must be like the smallest skull for the largest bill. Um, oh, let's see. This was the one. Bear with me. I, I um, The audio is not loud enough. If you if you can hear from my computer that howl monkeys. So the, the sun's starting to go down. We were, we were sitting on the river hoping hoping for some owls. I think we had um was it mottled, I think started calling that evening. But as we're just waiting, this like low growling, uh the howler monkeys that were out there was was absolutely incredible. Um we did Sorry, my um, thing just crashed. One second. That's, yeah. Sorry, this slide deck has a lot of videos in it and my 10 year old computer doesn't like playing lots of videos. So um, anyways, uh, uh, absolutely stunning sunset. Um, kind of incredible to me to think that we had started, you know, we set a 3 a.m. alarm and we still had people out um, well past sunset that night. Um, and even past sunset because you get back to your rooms and we're walking around with um, flashlights that uh, reflect UV light and you get to find things like these fun little scorpions. Um, fun to see there because they really look kind of uh, drier, more um, arid habitat. There's a still for you. Um, the fun thing, so they, they reflect this UV light, so it's very easy to find them. Um, 
we need to have a light on because here's what it looks like with our flashlight turned on. Um, luckily, uh, it seemed like we're all staying outside. Um, anyways, fun first day. At this lodge, Las Bacamayas, um, uh, they did have a little uh, uh, room that we could have meals in, but why would you do that when you could just kind of eat outside? So this was our setup for breakfast. You can actually see the river kind of right behind us there. There's a hummingbird feeder set up. Um, actually, if you, you see Dave just kind of right behind him, um, that's where things like these white-bellied emeralds um, and, and a few of these species, especially uh, um, this is not endemic, but for a few of the endemics, um, you'll, you'll see these range kind of shrinking down. But to have breakfast with things like white-bellied emerald, wedge-tailed saber wing, green-breasted mango, white-necked jacobin, um, literally just like buzzing around your heads, um, that's a nice way to start the day. We hopped on the boat and then went up a little further upriver um, to a place uh, uh, they called Peru. Um, I think it was the guy who like first uh, set up the trail there was from Peru, so it kind of got the name from him. Um, but this is where we would spend most of the day uh, birding. I just want to show a couple clips like this is what kind of birding in this habitat looks like. Some areas where it's really dense and um, it's all about kind of working holes and angles. You know, there are these, these secretive birds that we're trying to you know, lure in. Um, burning in the tropics often requires a little bit of playback because it's so dense, you're not going to see these birds otherwise, um, especially in an area where, you know, it's so infrequently visited. Um, we did find some more open places here. There's this one, um, uh, which was a collared forest falcon that was just like, um, if I had the, the, the audio on, it's just this loud constant and, and this bird would just not come in. So some birds are cooperative, some aren't. Um, we would get things like this chestnut collared, excuse me, chestnut colored uh, woodpecker. You can actually see the green laser pointer that we're using to point it out. Um, a lot of these videos are actually just uh, using my phone mounted to a spotting scope. Um, but nice to have real cooperative birds like this. One of my biggest targets um, for this area, uh, wish I could get slightly, you know, of course there's always that one branch that gets in the way. Uh, this is gray-throated chat. This is a, a NCA endemic or, or practically a Yucatan endemic. You can see that, that range map, um, a, a tough one to get. This, this is a bird we worked for a while and, and um, again, a tough one to see. Some bigger bird. I always love a big, big bird that's easy to see. Crested guan. This is maybe you know, um, think of it as like a slender turkey, but always kind of funny when you see a, a bird that size up in a tree. It's a little diversity of you know families uh, that we don't even get to think about here in Maine. White whiskered puff bird. Rufus-tailed uh, jacamar. This is you know, it looks like someone crossed a hummingbird and a kingfisher. And now the, the big target, the bird we were looking for on this hike, um, the name of this reserve is Las Guacamayas. Guacamayas translates to macaw. So we were there looking for these scarlet macaws. Um, this is a species that most people get to meet for the first time, like in a friend's house or a pet store, which is really kind of sad and depressing to think about because the pet trade is really wiped out. Um, a lot of macaws, um, a lot of parrots. Um, uh, so to be able to go on a hike like this, get out to this area where um, I think we saw six total um, uh, out in this area where they need these really large mature trees because they're cavity nesters. Um, unfortunately, there are not a lot of um, old growth trees like that uh, uh, still around as, as we could see that, that uh, um, slash and burn agriculture that's that's really kind of moved to there. So we're very lucky to have kind of these these areas um, that are being preserved, um, especially when it's you know such a amazing charismatic species and to get to see you know pairs doing courtship behaviors like this um, uh, was really something. It's funny, I, I joked about the uh, the pygmy Kingfisher being so small being so small in relation to the the size on the screen, but this actually <laughs> 
This feels uh, a little more accurate for size. These are massive birds. After this, uh, you know, long hike, um, this was one of our longer hikes, um, at least in terms of like taking the boat out, going way down this trail, coming back. Uh, we did go back for lunch. Um, one of the, my favorite things about birding in the tropics is that, you know, you get the early morning activity um, and it's going to get so hot that generally we'll take a little break in the afternoon. Everyone gets a siesta and then we go back out birding again. Unless it's the second day of your, your birding in Guatemala and no one wants to sleep. Um, so here we all are birding through the heat of the day. It's a little hard to see on the screen if I can get my cursor right there, right over our lunch table um, is a gartered trogon. Um, it's wonderful when they, uh, when they just come right to us. Uh, after our siesta, quote unquote, uh, we did go for an evening hike. Um, sorry, some of these videos do have some sound. So here's just Jesse kind of explaining. We were looking for a few of our targets here. Um, here's our slatey tail trogan. This is one of the larger ones. This audio plays. Let him. You can't hear that. It's this wonderful little. I'll give him a second to turn his head because um, that bill, it's this big honking bill on all. Yeah, that big red eye ring. And slaty tailed trogan actually has this bright red chest uh, and bellies. Who that he was turned around for us, but you can see a little bit of that red kind of peeping through. Um, there's some bird names down there that are a little frustrating. This is ivory billed wood creeper. Um, uh, we'd all love to rediscover the ivory billed woodpecker, but um, uh, fun to see those. White necked puffbird would be a, a nice one that showed off for us. And then one of our biggest targets for for this hike. Um, was this bird, Toadie Motmot. Motmots are this really cool family. Most of them are known for kind of the long, long tails that they do this almost like pendulum twitch. Um, uh, Toadie Motmot, you can see the, the range here. They're kind of all throughout Central America, um, but very localized within those areas. So um, there's definitely, you know, you see a big range like that, but birders kind of know ex exactly where to go to, to find some of these. So this was going to be a big target for us. End of the day, get back to our rooms. This is where I, I want to, you know, not looking for sympathy or anything, but um, the biological station there usually doesn't host um, large groups. It's usually just like a couple of birders go at a time. Um, our group with whatever you were, a dozen people, um, meant that we, we took up all the guest rooms and then Jesse and I had to go stay kind of up in the more bunk houses that are a little more um, rustic, let's just say. Um, our doors didn't go all the way down to the ground. So when I got back to my room this night, behind my bed was this little guy just looking for a big hug um so anyways if you go to some place like this make sure you get the room that the, the door goes down um to the floor so after a couple days there and, and i'm gonna pick hopefully pick up the cadence here because um we've got a lot to do but we decided um we're leaving los guacamayas uh we're gonna head east still staying in the northern part of the country but going um uh towards tikal towards the uh, uh national park there um, absolutely stunning day, great for travel. Um, uh, we met up with our next guy. This is Miguel. I'll share a bit more about him in a second, but I wanted to just show this is our, our lunch stop um, where we're basically the tree set up here, which you can't quite see off the left side is they had a pulley system. And they, along the pulley system, they had, um, think of uh, hair clips, you know, that have like the teeth that uh, do this. Those are apparently perfect. If you peel a banana, 
and put it in the hair clip and those are on the little pulley system and you wheel that out to that first tree then i think i zoom in in a second then you can get things like baltimore orioles and yellow winged tanagers and great tailed grackles uh so pretty distracting when you're trying to eat lunch and like there's life birds coming in um right out there tree we would see a lot especially uh, uh in this area called the saba tree this is um a sacred tree of the the mayan people it's also the guatemalan national tree um uh, as the the lore, I'll say, it goes, um, uh, the phrase, they, they say it, it represents the axis mundi. It's a vertical line that connects the, um, the underworld, the earth, and the heavens. So they see it as this very kind of important symbol. These are absolutely massive trees, um, and you'll see them kind of like prominently, uh, um, I don't know, cultivated is the right word, but... Um, untouched, I guess, is the, the nice thing to see with these. So there are lots of these very uh, old Saber trees around. So a bit of a dive, um, but again, um, the National Park uh, where Tikal is was our, our destination. Um, I think I missed this slide, but one of my favorite things to see, the, the entrance fee here, um, it, was, it was very low for, uh, for residents uh, or people of Guatemala. But it was some. It was either five or ten times the price for tourists, um, which like we felt good paying that. I guess um, this is an absolutely amazing spot. We stayed um, practically right in in Tikal. It's called the Jungle Lodge. Um, this is the Mayan Biosphere Reserve. Um, that part of Tikal, um, uh, Jungle Lodge has these nice little um, uh, dwelling. These units that. Uh, that we were kind of broken up into. Um, a fun thing, I always love kind of seeing some of the, what I'll just call the, the cultural changes, is that they had these hours of electricity. So times during the day that they would actually like have the power either on or off um, just to kind of help conserve up there, which, which um, we could all probably learn something from. Now, getting to Tikal, um, you know, as birders, we tend to have this, these lists of like target birds, things we really want to see. And definitely like one of the the, um, uh, the poster child, the, the one that is like um, any birder who's ever been here or, or up into the Yucatan, um, every Thanksgiving, they're going to post the same picture of an oscillated turkey. You know, this incredible, beautiful turkey. Um, and to think that, you know, this, this, um, gallinaceous bird that lives in the jungle and like, wouldn't it just be great to like catch a glimpse <laughs> in a national park with thousands of visitors, um, they've become pretty habituated and tame. Um, so you can walk right through the parking lots and see some, um, then you, you stand at the, you know, other angles so that you get the more wild looking background, but these were really cool, um, really cool species to get to see. Again, through things like um, hunting, um, uh, uh, they are just a, a really hard species to find kind of away from an area like this where they are otherwise habituated. Remember, we did see one as we were leaving the park um, on the last day there. Uh, there was one like walking on the side of the road and it was like, there's a wild one. You know, these are still wild, but um, just very used to to people. Um, a really cool looking bird. Um, that amazing iridescence. And there's that very limited range. This is a Yucatan endemic. Um, I hope Tova doesn't mind me telling this story. This is uh, Tova on the right. Um, uh, one of my favorite things of, of these trips is just getting to, you know, share these experiences with people. And when a bird is literally like going to bring someone to tears, um, that is, I just think, such a wonderful experience. Um, uh, one of Tova's kids was very much like, you know, I want you to go on, go on this trip and see a toucan. And so when we finally, a couple days into the trip, got this uh, kill build kill build toucan um, that popped right up, showed off. Um, uh, that was uh, definitely one of those one of those moments that uh, yes, we'll bring bring tears to your eyes. Um, 
let's see if there's audio for this one. Um, if not, well, maybe I should make sure. I don't think there's any swears. Um, bear with us. As we're walking around Tea Call, we met some very angry monkeys. Central American spider monkeys. Which were in the trees right over us, breaking branches and chucking them at us. So we decided to get to the other side of the road a little further away uh, because they're also part of the <laughs> vertigo in here. Um, there we are, looking back at them. They like to do things like pee on you, throw feces at you. There you can actually see them. They're doing a little like chest feeding. Um, they're not too thrilled, not quite as habituated as, uh, as the turkeys were. Um, these many hazards um, of birding in the area. Our next day, as we were back, would finally go into the park itself, um, here's everyone helping point out one of the uh, oscillated turkeys. Um, here's Miguel. I, I mentioned we had picked him up on our on our way, and he would be our our local guide. Um, uh, this will play. So he was a wonderful guide to have because of his history with the park. When when Tikal was basically like first found, and, and they were, um, or I should say, first doing this effort to unearth a lot of these. Um, uh, huge ruins that, as you'll see in a second, are there. He was with some of that original team. One of his jobs was to get the little little microflora, so he would literally just pull by hand little plants that were growing on, so that then they could start removing uh, the soil. They're so worried about, you know, certainly not going to bring in backhoes or anything to try and uh, uh, unearth these. Um, so it started with a job like that, literally just plucking a uh, little microflora. Um, and then as more and more researchers came in, um, uh, and it was an archeologist who like knew the birds that started teaching the birds to him. So that now many years later, um, he can literally tell you anything you want him to know about this part and is one of the kind of best birders in the area. So we were very lucky to have him um, so this looks over. Birding through uh, Tikal was um, a little tough. You can see kind of, you know, the, the habitat that we're going through. Um, the fun thing in this video, generally it was just like our group on ourselves. You know, you're going through this, this kind of amazing forest. Um, it's so dense there. It's, it's almost scary how dense it is. What was funny was we, as we were getting up this trail, all of a sudden more and more people started coming together. And we realized it was because we got to kind of the first temple, Temple 4, one of the more famous sites there. And I was quickly trying to get my scope set up because there's one bird that is kind of famous for sitting up on Temple 4, um, and that's orange-breasted falcon. This is arguably one of the hardest falcons in the New World to see. Um, they do have this pretty extensive range, but um, much like I was talking uh, about before, like the mama, these are these are hyper localized. Um, much like a falcon, you know, they love nesting on like tall cliffs and things. So, what's better than having you know a, a giant temple um, uh, that was built there? We're in Tikal. We're looking at a falcon. If you know anything about some pop culture references, like this one. Guys, episode four, a new host. The Millennium Falcon is going to land on uh, the Yavin 4 boot. Does this look familiar? So of course we had to pose for the uh, the same shot. Um, very fun to see falcons in that place. Um, looking back at uh, I think that's Temple One and Two. Uh, anyways, um, uh, super fun to uh, <laughs> to go without a childhood dream. Um, this is where I have to say you know there, there's so much to talk about here that I I shouldn't be the one to talk about um, because it would take 
more than an hour in and of itself. Um, there, there's too much here. I will strongly encourage, like, go home, watch a YouTube video or something. Um, the Mayan people and these incredible tools they built and how they laid that out to be able to essentially use the position of the sun, you know, I will give you the most oversimplified way that if you're standing on Temple 4 and you look back towards Temple 1, the day that the sun sets and is perfectly lined up through the top of that tower is the day that you need to harvest your crops. Months later when it's you know, setting and it is directly through the top of Temple 3, that's when you need to, you know, plant next year's. Like it is insane, the layout, the scale of this place, the size of these temples, and they are all basically used as these aids towards their agriculture, um, using things like the sun. Go to someone who knows what they're talking about, explain it, and it will blow your mind so much more than that because I still have a ton of slides to get through. Um, also really fun uh, for us because, so Jesse Fagan, our guide, wrote the field guide to the birds of Northern Central America. Um, and the temple on the cover of his book uh, was this one right here. Note to self, if you are ever traveling with the author of a field guide and you're standing at the location, have him sign the book then there at the time. Because when you say, oh, we'll do it later. Then you come back to Maine and you look at your field guide that hasn't been signed. I'm, I'm a little bitter about that one. Um, this would be towards the end of our time um, uh, uh, on this region. So targeting a few, the last few um, endemics that we could look for. Horrible photo because it's getting late in the day. This is one of the Mayarkis flycatchers. So think about like great crested flycatcher. Um, that's what they look like, but this is the Yucatan flycatcher. The reason it was getting late in the day, because this was one of our other targets, the Yucatan poor will. Um, fun to get a flashlight on that. And then we had also walked back to this, uh, this, this kind of wet area, um, oat-filled heron. Uh, one of the most appropriately named birds. Looks a lot like a, you know, black crown night heron. Yeah, yeah. It's got those massive eyes. This is a nocturnal bird. Um, but yeah, look at the size of that bill. Um, very fun, very cool. There are a bunch of geniles kind of hanging around this little wet area. Now it's time to go south. We're done with our, our trip to the Petten. Um, we'd fly back to Guatemala City hop in a bus um, and go down to Antigua. Antigua, Guatemala. Um, this old city was absolutely beautiful, stunning. Um, and especially after some of our, you know, I like to think that we stay at some really nice places on, on these trips, but the North is a little like hot, um, humid, much like we, we talked about in the, the looking at the bioregions. So to be able to come and like, you know, this is like the courtyard. This is one of like six courtyards at this hotel. Um, this was nice. Um, we did all right. So this afternoon, um, we would go on a walking tour of Antigua. This is another one of those things that I'm going to gloss over so quickly um, because there's just an absolutely insane history here. Um, in 1979, uh, Antigua was... Um, designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, because of the, um, uh, I had to look up this word, Baroque-influenced architecture. Um, the layout of it is incredible. It's basically a giant chessboard. Um, and then the, the churches, the ruins, um, it's, it's absolutely an incredible city. Um, highly recommend it. We got to do a jade tour um, while we were there. Um, Again, another thing that we just kind of have to gloss over, but this is um, Guatemala um, is the source of so much of the, the jade that we see kind of around the world and was very important to Mayan people. So it's really fun to kind of get these, these cultural tie-ins. That's what I really like about um, uh, these tours that we're able to make them not just 100% about the birds, um, but also hand it over to the people that can explain it <laughs> better than I can. Um, we were there, um, uh, uh, 
again, I think we're, we're, we're getting into the second week of March. Um, uh, we got to be there for the, the Holy Week processions. Um, so very strong uh, Catholic influence. We, we got to visit some of the, go into some of these churches. Um, what you see on the left here, um, lots of, of food, um, fruits and vegetables kind of laid out around that. But in the center is actually dyed sawdust. So they would make these, um, they would call them sawdust carpets. Um, this is just an example of one, but all throughout the, the roads throughout the city, they would lay out these, you know, essentially these offerings, these carpets like this for the procession that would come around. Um, people taking turns carrying this absolutely massive uh, display here coming under the arch. Um, but again, the roads are just kind of, of uh, lined with the, the sawdust park. Again, absolutely wonderful cultural experience. Um, but it's eight o'clock, birds. <laughs> um, excuse me, uh, a Finca is a farm. So this was uh, Finca El Pilar. Um, this would get us up to some really high elevation, close to 7,000 feet um, of elevation. Great to get there first thing in the morning, this wonderful kind of vista looking off, and especially seeing some of the volcanoes in this area. It was really impressive. There's three you could see from here. There's the third. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Acatenango, Agua, I think that's Agua on the right, and then Fuego um, was actually, you know, every now and then you would hear like this rumble, um, and it was every so often we would start throwing off a little smoke, which was, uh, kept things interesting. This is where we're getting into the elevation and getting into some of these broadleaf and, and conifer forests. And there's some real special birds that um, that we'd be looking for in, in this entirely new habitat. So we're gonna start to see, you know, some of these more maps just showing how endemic these birds are. Rufus collared robin, bushy crested jay. <laughs> that was the best photo I could get one this diving out of the way. Um, black cap swallow, another endemic. These birds seem to be getting further and further away, but um, a fun one to look at was um, of the sharp shin hawks that are there. Excuse me. There's a subspecies of these ones that are entirely white breasted. Um, there's something like 16 species of subspecies of sharp tail, sharp shinned hawk across their range. These ones are very distinctive, occurring in a very distinct uh, region, um, seems to be very little gene flow. So this is one that like in the future, this will probably get split into its own species. Um, so nice to have that one kind of uh, in the books for us. One of our big targets that we, you know, talk about working angles and holes, um, how we spotted uh, this bird. Um, Daniel was one of our uh, uh, young bird or a local guide that we had hired this day. And his ability to get a scope just pointed perfectly through um, these branches. With that caveat, here's the best photo I could get. Uh, um, so blue-throated motmot -mot would be a big target for us. This is, again, you can see endemic to that area. That's what it looks like um, if you were to, to paint a beautiful picture, but um, nice to be able to, to track down that bird. You can see that little black behind the eye in my shot, but anyways. As we would travel from um, from here, we wanted to get a little further west and get up into the mountains. Um, to get there was when we had to go a little bit south, and this is where it's a little hard to see. There are some, you know, some pretty impressive mountains and things, but all across the landscape here, we were basically looking at sugarcane, and you would just see truck after truck go by with um, uh, transporting it, um, which is too bad. Los Torales was the, the farm that we would end at, spend the last couple of days there. Um, um, it's an amazing farm. Um, I wish if I could, if I could have gone up to 170 slides, um, I would have shown just, uh, next time you're at like Home Depot and you walk by the little section and you're like, wow, look at all these like spider plants. And like, it probably came from here. He actually like sells a lot of the ornamental plants that like we have in our gardens. Um, they had acres and acres and acres um, that just went on and on of this. 
Um, the bird you can see in the photo there is horned guan. Um, that is the, 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 the unicorn uh, bird. They are only a super high elevation. That's a bird that like most people will take a specific trip just to go see that bird. Um, uh, the the marched, marked from hell, I've heard it described as. So we decided to not go for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we would take it a little bit easier. Oh, here's just a fun shot. Um, uh, Los Torales, they also um, grow um, and roast their own coffee. So that's actually um, unroasted coffee. You can see off to the right, some through the process on the left. Um, this was taken in the morning. And by the time we got back in the afternoon, like all that had been cleared out already. Um, I still have one bag. I know I should drink it when it's fresh, but it's just so good. Um, anyways, uh, rather than taking a, that horrible hike, um, we use the vehicles of some of the, um, the people on the property there. Uh, I got to sit in the back of one of the Jeeps and, and um, didn't quite have a seat, but it made for great view recording the, the vehicle coming back behind us. Um, Oh no, this isn't the one of the clips I have. You can see the the vehicle bottom out on the way across. But we're climbing. We're trying to get up into elevation, um, and it was a lot easier to do it by vehicle. Uh, so in Los Terrales, um, we're trying to get up to what's called uh, La Isla. So it's it's this island up in uh, this kind of high elevation, and you can really you know you can see those like super steep cliffs. This was an amazing kind of trail system. Um, Again, all sorts of agriculture going on through here, but it was wonderful to see. It wasn't just like these monocultures of what they were growing. We would see, you know, coffee that was planted, but still surrounded by native plants. And this is one of the really important things that we need to think about when we're buying coffee is kind of where it's coming from, if it's shade grown, um, et cetera, et cetera. We actually got a wonderful lesson in, in coffee while we were there. Um, These are coffee plants. Um, one of our big targets at this spot we thought we could hear them kind of down in this ravine, but they wouldn't respond to playback or anything. It was Azure Rumped Tanninger. Um, nice to have a reason to go back. <laughs> we we didn't get them, but um, it's a, it's very funny in, in Central South America. Some tan, some species of tanningers, you know, you put out a banana and they're there. You can take all the photos you want. Some are completely, you know, just shy of, of handouts like that. So. That's one that got away, um, but there were some absolutely spectacular birds there. Slate-throated red start um, was really fun to see, especially if you know if this is a bird you've seen kind of anywhere across their range. When you see them further north in Mexico, they have this really kind of deep red belly. The ones in Guatemala, middle range, it starts turning orange. And then if you were to see them down in like Costa Rica, they have yellow. Um, and so it was fun to see because in Audubon, we've now done the Oaxaca tour where we saw the red ones. We did the Costa Rica tour where we saw the yellow ones and we just <laughs> filled in the gradient. Again, nice picking on the endemics. This was a more recently split species. It used to be called uh, paltry tyranulate, um, which was kind of had this, uh, this big range all throughout Central America. Um, and then uh, it, much like most flycatchers, tyran tyranulates are a type of flycatcher. Um, you know, they don't, they don't look like much, um, but people realized that they had a unique noise, um, kind of had this isolated population. So paltry tyranulate was um, split into four species and, uh, and this is the Guatemalan tyranulate. Fun to get to see it in Guatemala. Uh, Blue-tailed hummingbird, another NCA endemic. Um, I should have gotten a better photo showing its blue tail, but uh, it was fun to see like that little, the little rufus in the wing is actually a better field mark. Just birding around the grounds um, here, as I mentioned, like some birds love coming out to the, the handouts. Um, uh, Black-headed saltator, these kind of large aggressive birds um, and absolutely just beautiful colors. Uh, we don't get enough uh, uh, yellows like that up here. Things like cinnamon hummingbird. Um, these were wonderful grounds for, we, we had a couple, especially afternoons that it was like, you want to hang out by the feeders you can you can uh, walk around but they've done such a nice job kind of um, uh, with putting out feeders with having lots of plants um, there was so much bird life just right around the grounds 
another one of our endemics we were looking for, folks might know like plain chalaca is a widespread chalaca species. Um, uh, when you get down into NCA, um, there is this one kind of more Pacific coast, uh, the white bellied chachalaca that just has that really narrow range. So fun to see this pair kind of sitting up together. As we get um, uh, leaving there, why not take one more boat ride? This was more just, I would say, kind of a, a, a leisure cruise. Um, when you need to get from one end of a lake to another, you can either sit on the bus and take a long way around, or you can take a boat and let the bus driver <laughs> meet you across. So we decided to take a quick tour of uh, Lake Atitlan. This is the largest lake um, with these absolutely beautiful views of the volcanoes. Um, it's most famous for the, the Atitlan grebe, or giant grebe it was sometimes called. Um, uh, looks a lot like pied billed greed, but this thing was much larger. Um, unfortunately, uh, after bass were introduced to the lake, the bass started eating the chicks. Um, uh, that started a, a pretty steep decline of, of their population. Um, interestingly, by in 1976, there was an earthquake that actually like fractured the bed of the lake and caused the water level to drop so significantly. And these are birds that are nesting, you know, on um, aquatic vegetation. So all of a sudden, if you have a huge drop in the water level, um, they couldn't nest. So by 1983, there were 32 individuals left. And actually a huge problem for them, as we mentioned, they look a lot like pied-billed grebes. They started hybridizing with pied-billed grebes. So um, of those 32 that were left, many of them, like they weren't, the gene pool is getting muddy. The, the ones that were left were hybridizing with pie billed mm -hmm. grebes so that by 1989, there were two seen and that would be the last time they'd ever be seen, um, which is super sad. Um, birds do go extinct. Uh, this is, uh, we, we got dropped off. Um, the boat took us across and I, I was gonna leave this up but they dropped us off at the wrong spot. Um, we all of a sudden found ourselves in this like very nice resort um, and Jesse had to be like guys blend <laughs> except we are all you know in khaki binoculars um, this is like pretty early in the morning we're walking you know people are having breakfast um, so we did get out of there the funny thing was as we're trying to catch up with our van because we need to get to our, our last birding spot we had some phenomenal birds um, and it's real. It's really uh, tough as a guide to be like, yes, I know, I know that's a life bird for you, but like, let's keep going. But so things like blue and blue and white mockingbird that we had actually we had gotten glimpses of them before are all of a sudden just like a parking lot bird here. Uh, white faced ground sparrow. Um, same thing. We're literally like flagging down the van, and all of a sudden we hear these these chip notes of these very cool. These are like big sparrows. Um, Really cool look to them, very restricted range. Um, but the whole point of us kind of trying to get on this van and get going was to get to this place, um, uh, Finca Corrales, um, in, in, if I can say this right, um, Chicho, Chichoc um, was, was that, that town. So here's Daniel, who's one option before. Um, he was birding with us when we were near Antigua. Then when we went uh, further west, we sent Daniel to go do a little scouting because we basically had this one afternoon to go for our big target bird. So Daniel had visited a bunch of spots, found the range of this one bird we were looking for. Um, and here he is just introducing, this is the, the landowner kind of telling the story. Because one of the cool pieces here, um, the places that, that we were birding, um, the majority of it was a essentially a Christmas tree farm. Now this Christmas tree it doesn't quite look like the ones that we have here, but it is a nice conifer that grows down there. And it's actually been so over harvested that there's very little of it left. And there's some birds like this, this is yellow eyed junco, but the Guatemalan race is actually like really specific and someday might, it probably should be its own species. Um, fun to get to go to a farm where they're actually like sustainably growing these 
quote unquote tri Christmas trees, um, which have otherwise been like so over harvested. So that was uh, a fun target to see, but really nice when you have someone like Daniel who has scouted the location and can just say, let's come a little further. Um, gets us on the spot because the bird that we had, you know, on the cover of the program, um, what I was thinking of the bird of the trip um, goes by the, the, the nickname frosty headed or the pink headed warbler. Um, and that was absolutely, uh, I would say one of the best ways to kind of end this trip um, to get these, uh, you know, what is this? It looks like a strawberry that's been like dipped in something. Um, uh, and it's a little warbler. Uh, absolutely amazing. Um, that was such a, a, a kind of great kind of end to the trip because from there we did have a nice little barbecue afterwards, but that was uh, such a nice bird to essentially end on. With my last couple slides, I want to make a quick plug. As I mentioned, Magnolia Warbler, one of our most abundant songbirds that we would see down there. Um, oops. Let me play this. Um, hopefully you've seen these maps before. Here's just an animated um, where these birds are. And we think of them as breeding up here. We're in fall migration right now. Look at how you know range restricted they are in that non-breeding season, like especially around the Yucatan, northern part of Guatemala. Um, they need more area to breed, makes sense. So a couple of quick plugs, things we need to think about. If I can get my cursor back. Um, Oh my God, Guatemalan coffee is so good. Um, it's even better when it's grown in a way that's protecting the habitat for these birds. So you've probably seen it in our newsletter, it's a York County Audubon newsletter, but this is what we're talking about when we talk about shade grown coffee. It's really easy to destroy habitat, plant coffee, it grows faster, it tastes more bitter, and it's cheaper. Um, but when you can preserve the bird's habitat by having it kind of grow um, um, in these more sustainable ways. Um, there is a company called Finca Sayon, just from Guatemala, and you can buy it on Amazon. And it is shade-grown Guatemalan coffee. So awesome. I used to buy it for quite a while. Awesome. <laughs> um, I have to quickly mention windows and things that birds fly into. Um, I hope you're paying attention with uh, work Maine Audubon's doing, especially my colleague uh, Nick Lyon with the Bird Safe uh, Project. Um, the number of birds that they're finding, you know, hitting buildings, um, hitting windows, um, the buildings in Portland is 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 so sad. There's a lot of work going forward to make like future development need to have um, uh, treated glass, et cetera, et cetera we need to just be talking about it more, be more aware of it. A lot of birds die from, from flying into structures. Could kind of tie this back into that, that need, but we're, we're in a, uh, a biological crisis right now. Um, uh, we, we've lost 30% of all birds since 1970. Um, that's unacceptable. Bottom of the food chain, let's plant native plants in our backyards. For the love of God, keep your cats indoors. Um, uh, the number one anthropomorphic or anthropogenic cause of, of bird mortality is somewhere over um, uh, uh, close to 2 billion birds per year in the U.S. alone are from cats. Um, uh, in closing, the, the other plug I wanted to make, like if you are thinking about going to a place like Guatemala, um, yeah, it's super easy to use eBird and find these spots and like know where to go. But hiring local guys is like so important. Um, especially learning some of the cultural aspects. Like here is Miguel talking about, um, so proud of his Mayan um, background and how like literally, what is it? The, um, how short uh, Mayan's pointer fingers are, how their thumbs like can't bend as far back. And, and these are just things like that we were connecting on in such a, an interesting level. Also, he's the best birder there. Um, he's going to do a lot better than like Merlin just playing on your phone. Um, trust me, uh, we need to support these support these people. Um, yeah, in closing, here's just our, our trip report. We ended with around 327 species, um, which is pretty incredible. Again, it's that kind of southern influence. A lot of our wintering birds, um, 327 species. 15 of those were NCAs, North um, 
excuse me, Northern Central American endemics. Um, we ended up with something like eight species of mammals. Um, I do want to thank everyone who came. I know Dave's here. Um, this was a super fun group. I, I, I feel so lucky to get to um, do these tours, get to show people um, uh, uh, some of these really important places around the world that have both you know, amazing birds, sometimes our birds, um, amazing kind of cultural tie-ins as well. Um, and I hope this is where I would have put the slide up of, of where our next tour is going. Um, we're shooting for Machu Picchu. 2024, um, if we can pull it off. Stay tuned. Um, I know we're uh, uh, getting a little late. So thank you all so much for hanging in there with me, taking this quick trip to Guatemala. Um, I'm happy to hang out and take questions, but I know people got to get going. Um, take off. Any questions? It was an hour and 20 minutes. We covered a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah.